everybody. Welcome back. We've made it to week three. All righty. So today we're going to talk about um, uh, the different types of um, tissues. And then in chapter six, we're going to start talking about the integumentary system. So let's go ahead and get started. So Alrighty then. Monty's in my armpit. You gonna come out and say hello or are you gonna come up the backside? We'll see. Oh, maybe he's coming up the backside here. There he is. Hi. He's being shy today. Okay, so now that we've talked about cells and we've pretty much gotten over kind of the rough spots of this course in some ways, um, like I said, the first four chapters usually throw everybody for an absolute loop because like I said, it's, it's just, we're just driving by um, a lot of major biology concepts and just touching on them lately. And um, like I said, it's really helpful to have a biology course uh, before anatomy and physiology, but not everybody's got that luxury. Um, so yeah, that's why the first four chapters are usually everybody's like, oh, but now, now we're getting into the meat and potatoes of what anatomy and physiology is. So now we've talked about all the underlying biology and how these things all come together from the biochemistry to the, to the cells on the cellular level. And now we're gonna talk about how cells make up humans and pretty much enter into anatomy and physiology proper. Oh, hey, hey, there you are. You gonna come out and say hey today? You're just gonna be shy. Yeah, I think he'll be a little shy today. Or he'll wander around and get a little crazy. Anyway, so how do, th how do cells make everything up? So remember, cells uh, make up tissues. So a whole bunch of similar cells come together to make up tissues. They work together to make up uh, the tissues come together and make up an organ and then an organ makes us up as organisms. And we covered this back in chapter one, but this is what we're gonna be looking at right now is we're gonna be staring going into the tissues. And there's four major types of tissues in your body. Granted, you're gonna find as we move along in this course, there's several different ways to um, break things down and classify things in your body and actually some things that like when we go into the integumentary system and we go into uh, the skeletal system and we go into the muscle system there's actually more than one way to, that we classify certain things so um, and we're going to run into that a couple of times in this uh, semester definitely. So remember, there's more than one way to classify things in the body, and we'll get into that. But first let's talk about, well, how do cells stay together? I don't know if this has ever crossed your mind. Has it crossed your mind, Monty? He doesn't know. Anyway, so now we're, we're considered a tube within a tube body plan. And we have spaces between our cells, and these spaces are called intracellular spaces. But that doesn't answer how exactly all the cells stay stuck together. Well, we actually kind of glue them together in different ways, or it's more like thinking about welding, but in a, bio in a biological sense, which is kind of like, what? But you, you follow me here, it's, it's a little weird, but it's interesting. And that is this, that we have actually uh, structures called intercellular junctions, and there's several different types. The three that your book goes over are the tight junctions, the desmosome, and the gap junctions. Now, um, they also have different names on occasion, like if you use pick up another book, which you know I've done in the past, I'm not saying you should, don't, don't go out and get another book, they're expensive, as you probably already know. Um, but sometimes they'll, they'll call them different names. So same thing, different name. You'll hit that a lot um, in this course. Where are you going? Anyway, so tight junctions. These close the gaps between cells and these are uh, located in cells that usually form linings. Anything that's like, you know, any bunch of epithelial tissues that are like lining your uh, uh, organs or lining your, uh, the inside of your trunk or, you know, where all your organs are hanging out inside of your body. So 
So they're usually look like these. They kind of look like rivets. So this is what a tight junction looks like, and that's why they're called a tight junction, because they're kind of riveted together with these uh, tight junction proteins that are uh, all the way through the cell membranes and holding everything together. So I kind of liken these to like rivets. If you think back in the old days of how we used to uh, keep metal together, which was actually rivets, which is interesting. Um, the Titanic actually had a lot of rivets on it, um, which actually was extremely strong. Um, that wasn't the issue <laughs> running into the uh, iceberg was. But, you know, there's a lot of buildings still today that were built with rivets and are still standing, like the Empire State Building, the Chrysler Building. Um, there's probably some in other c cities other than New York that I'm thinking that I can think of, but I can't think right now. I don't... I think Sears was more modern, the Sears Tower. I'd have to go look that up. Anyway, um, so tight junction, uh, kind of like rivets. All right, desmosome. So the desmosome form spot welds, and it's usually located among the outer skin. So uh, you're going to see this, especially in the next chapter, we're going to be talking about how cells slough off all the time. Actually, about 98% of all house dust, unfortunately, is your own skin. So yeah, there wouldn't be any dust in your house if you weren't in it, but then you wouldn't get to do all the stuff in your house. Yeah, Monty's lucky. His skin comes off in usually one kind of strip, although sometimes he has bad shots where he strips randomly all over the place, and I have to, it's like he's exploded in his house. Snakes. Anyway, so gap junctions. Gap junctions look like these. Instead of having like full proteins, gap junctions are like this, but they actually have a hole through it, kind of like a straw. So imagine a whole bunch of straws holding the, uh, things together. So these are tubular channels between cells. They're located in the cardiac muscle cells. We, these guys we talk about when we talk about the cardiac system in the next semester, because I'm going to go, like if you're in 169, whoever you take it with, whether it be me or somebody else, they'll, they'll uh, mention how all the cardiac muscle cells are held together by these intercalculated discs. And those discs have these gap junctions going through. And these are protein channels. So that way it can send signals super fast without having to worry about going past two cell membranes and an intracellular space in between. So not only does it weld the uh, cells together, it also makes it so um, uh, chemical messages going between the two cells go like that. So it's, it's kind of like playing telephone except way faster and uh, the other cell doesn't get confused by the message. <sighs> I don't know if you've ever played telephone and, you know, usually the person at the end is like, what? Because <laughs> it usually gets a little weird. But anyway, so, so um, protein channels, gap junction, tight junction, uh, doesn't have the channels, kind of like rivets. And desmosome are also known as kind of like... Uh, uh, an adhesion junction. So these ones are easy to break apart. Like I said, these ones easy to break apart. They have uh, protein filaments that kind of stitch it together. And, uh, and then, well, like I said, they're easy to break. They pop off. That's why we use it in our skin because our skin is actually designed to shed off. It's actually one of the parts. That's why it's a protective barrier for us. Because um, we have a cascade of just constantly shedding, shedding, shedding. Unlike Monty, who just does it in one fell swoop. Which, thinking about and seeing what he has to go through to shed, um, I think we've got a little better. I mean, could you imagine? And like after, I mean, we've all had sunburns. I mean, I, in a way, I hope you haven't had a sunburn. But I would unfortunately think that anybody who's been on Earth has had a sunburn. And you know when your skin peels and you're peeling sections of it off yeah now imagine having to do that every so often and no snakes don't do it like you know whenever they're growing because they're always growing um monty does it like four to five times a year maybe six it just depends on you know his metabolism and what he's doing so he's going through shed right now i'm kind of waiting for him to actually shed you're going to get that over with or you're going to save it for the weekend so i come back to a lovely mess on the on monday 
Anyway, so those are the three types of uh, junctions that your uh, book likes to talk about. So that's basically how cells stay stuck together. So if you've ever wondered how all of your cells stay stuck together, there you go. So overall, there are four main types of tissues in the human body. So we split everything into four types. You've got your epithelial, your connective, your muscular, and your nervous. So these are the four big boys that we kind of generally split everybody in your body out into. And it's interesting because some of them, and we're going to go over each one of these four. Now, granted, a lot of these we're going to get into deeper later on, like nervous tissue. We're just touching on them really quick here. And trust me, they get three chapters all by themselves. Uh, muscular gets split up because there's actually three flavors of muscular. The one that we're going to uh, definitely deep, uh, deep dive into is going to be our, our skeletal system. Or not skeletal system, our muscular system or skeletal or the ones that work with their skeleton, excuse me. And um, so that way we can go, uh, and you can see all my flab because I don't have anything. I used to at the zoo, man. When I was a zookeeper, I used to bench press the pig snakes. I had guns, I miss those. I should get bigger snakes. What do you think, Monty? Yeah, you're right, it's a lot of food to feed them. Anyway, um, so anyway, and then uh, connective tissue uh, to keep us all together. And it's interesting because there's some things that you probably don't think about that actually are considered connective tissue. So we'll get into that little surprise later. But the first one we're definitely going to talk about is epithelial because epithelial tissues line a lot of your cavities, a lot around your organs, uh, keeps your organs in place, all that fun jazz. So again, this is good stuff. Um, this is my buddy Anton von Leeuwenhoek. Um, if you ever uh, watched my uh, TED Ed on the cell theory, I talk about him. He's a cool dude. He's actually, we consider him like the father of modern microscopy or uh, because he's the one that kind of named bacteria without naming bacteria. Yeah, he called them animacules because he thought they looked like little animals. So yeah, and molecule, you know, get it? Molecule, small animal, animalcules, very cute. Very cute. He was an interesting guy. Um, he basically discovered bacteria by looking at uh, dental scrapings. He'd scrape gunk off his teeth, stick it on his microscope, which is this thing right here, and just stare at it. So, yeah, you know, fun pastimes. Anyway, he was a cool dude, though. Anyway, so let's go ahead and get into uh, epithelial tissues. And first, we've got to understand that there are classifications of epithelial, and it's based on their shape. Now, this is where um, I might at the end of this uh, chapter pop open some things I linked on your, um, in this part, uh, in this week, in the notes section, which are actually PowerPoints from another person, because your book shows it as way too perfect. And when you look at it under a microscope, you can get these guys kind of confused if you don't know exactly what you're looking at and how they differ. So I might be going over some actual slides with you so that way you can kind of get a difference between them. Because like I said, your book and the pictures in your book are really nice because they're like perfect pictures, looking for perfect examples. But it doesn't mean what you see under an actual microscope in a lab is the same thing because trust me a lot of it looks like and um, i want to try and clear that up so at the end of this i might actually flip over in a minute and show you exactly what some of these guys look like um actual slides so that way you're going oh okay because you know so you know basically Anyway, so found all over the human body, these uh, tissues cover the surface of your body, your organs, the inner lining of your body cavities, aligned hollow cavities, and composed of glands. Uh, we'll talk about all that fun gland stuff in a minute. A thin uh, extracellular layer is called the basement membrane. This is where everybody attaches to, so we have this basement membrane right here. So, because everybody needs a point of attachment or else we're, you know, that's not cool. You don't want your skin falling off. 
<laughs> so anyway, these tissues usually do not have blood vessels as the connective tissue below has a ton. So the basement membrane, they, de they depend on all the stuff in the basement membrane to feed these guys. And um, these tissues also divide like crazy. And so new cells can quickly replace lost or damaged ones. And we're going to get into this big time when we talk about, of course, the uh, int your integumentary system, your skin. Because this is pretty much what our skin is, especially these squamous. So there's three general shapes. There's the squamous, which I like to go squished. Uh, squamous for squish. No, actually, that's probably squishes, not what it's named after, but anyway. But they kind of look like plates. They're very thin. Um, our skin, our definitely our outer layer is made up of these guys big time. Um, and we use these a lot. They're very cheap to make, uh, biological, energy-wise. Very cheap, which is why we can get rid of, we can lose so many that we do every day and not really worry about it terribly much. So these guys, very thin. You can usually see them um, uh, very thin, easy to, you'll, trust me, when I show you the pictures, you'll be like, oh, okay. Next up is cuboidal. Uh, uh, and as its name suggests, it's more cuby. Um, so it's a lot chubbier than squamous. Squamous is definitely very thin, plate-like. Uh, cuboidal is very cube-like. And then there's the tall boys. Ha 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 ha. Uh, using the lingo of the children. Anyway, I have a nine-year-old. He comes out, he comes home saying some interesting <laughs> My favorite is he came home one day, and I don't know where I told you this, but uh, he came home one day unironically, had his hat on backwards, and put some stuff on his arms and said, Mommy, look at my drip. And I was like, mm. Okay. It's lovely, honey. <laughs> so I was just like, yeah. Oh. And for those of you who don't know what drip is, it's basically the equivalent of swag or bling. Just in case. If you wanted to know the lingo of the of the younglings, then there you go. So it's all, you know, all this stuff. His drip, because it drips off of you. Like Monty. Monty could be drip right now. Monty, are you drip? No, he's squeezing. Anyway, so he's getting warm around my neck right now. Anyway, so columnar are very tall. And, um, and some of them are interesting. So we, we base uh, a lot of epithelial tissues of the cells based on their shape. However, and you're going to see this in the pictures I'm going to show you in a minute, the columnar and the, you can kind of get the cub cuboidal and the columnar confused on occasion. I'm going to show you where the differences lie. And it's just... It's just um, practice, really, that gets you through that. Um, like, you know, now over years and years of looking through, you know, microscope, I can say, yeah, that's cuboidal, that's columnar. But, you know, for people first time looking through, you can easily get these two confused. And sometimes the cuboidals are, look kind of thin, so occasionally you can get them slightly confused with a fat squamous. So usually though squamous is very easy to spot it's the thinnest one of the bunch sometimes these guys get a little weird and we'll get into how and in just right now so on top of the shape let's talk about how many layers if you've got one layer of these it's called simple so like if you have one layer of squamous it's called simple squamous yes this is going to come back to bite you later so, however, if you have more than one layer, it's always named by the layer of the cells on the top. So, for instance, this is a stratified squamous epithelium because it's nothing but squamous cells, especially on top. So, they're named after the cells on top, not the cells on the bottom. Okay? So, that is stratified because there's many layers and it's a squamous on top, so it's a stratified squamous epithelium. All right? Same thing here with the cuboidal. If you just got one layer, it's simple cuboidal epithelium. If you got more than one layer of cuboidal, it's stratified cuboidal epithelium. And then last but not least, we've got columnar. Columnar actually gets his own third grouping because he's a special boy. So simple columnar epithelium, like they give you a beautiful example of what's in your small intestine right here because the small intestine uh, columnar epithelium have a lot of these microvilli on top. And it's kind of interesting because if you zoom in, these even have micro, micro, microvilli on top of these microvilli. 
uh, which is actually why the, your small intestines, if you stretched it out, are the size of a tennis ball court. Because remember what I said, the more you see folds and wiggles, that means we need a lot more surface area to do um, chemistry across or diffusions or whatever. In this case, in your intestines, it's absorbing as much food and nutrients as, of, out of what we eat. So anyway, then you've got cuboidal uh, columnar on columnar, which is stratified columnar. Now they've got a third one where the columnar are not all nice and even and they're all funky foo. <coughs> and as you can see, yeah, that's pseudo stratified because like, you know, here's one that's like a lump at the end, but thin at the top. And it's like somebody went out trying to cut a pizza and they completely borked it up. And then you have a reaction of, Ugh. I don't know if you've seen those things like on social media where they post those memes where somebody's like cut a pie or a pizza wrong and you're just like, yeah. It's kind of like that. <laughs> so pseudo stratified is actually one of the easiest to pick out because they're so all uneven. It's, it's really easy to pick out a pseudo stratified columnar epithelium because it's like, wow, these are really uneven. Is that pseudo stratified? Mm -hmm, that's pseudo stratified for you. So like I said, this is where it gets a little confusing because sometimes these guys can squish down and look like cuboidals. But I'll show you in a minute like I said, some pictures of the differences between. Now, glands. We've got two types of glandular epithelial tissues. We've got exocrine glands, glands that secrete into open surfaces. Exo means out. So these are glands going out of your body. Um, so they're going out. So sweat, sweat, um, which is literally just salty water. I know there's people that sit there and say, oh yeah, you need to sweat all the toxins out of your body. Guys, Sweat doesn't get toxins out of your body. It only gets salty water out of your body. It's to cool you down. It is not to get toxins out of your pores. Sorry. Um, the only way to get toxins out of your body is using your kidneys. Your kidneys get toxins out of your body. You're welcome. Anyway, I, I just, you know, the people, it's like, oh, we got to sweat the toxins out. It's like, that's not, that's not how that works. That's not how that works. Anyway, oils, um, unfortunately, I, I, I make lots of oils. And um, milk, which I have made in the past when I was, you know, I had my son, which is its own insanity. I'll go off about that next semester if you want to take a class with me next semester. Or if you've had a child and you breastfed. And remember, no shame if you didn't. Fed is best. I am not one of those people that shame people. I hate that. It's just, dude, whatever it takes. Feed the baby. Who cares? Anyway, so serous fluid and mucus. So all that fun stuff. So all the mucus in your mouth. Uh, our, our beautiful earwax. That's some more things that come out of exocrine glands in our ears. Uh, all that fun jazz. Um, so, and we've got different types of that. We've got the American gland, which is basically what you see in your stomach. So this is this is the stomach. Um, these guys secrete out. They have intact cells in here. So these are the ones that are usually uh, pumping out a whole bunch of different things. Uh, we'll get more into these guys in the digestive system. Apocrine gland. This is what you see uh, in um, uh, our mammary glands when we're making milk. It actually, the, uh, what we're making when we're making milk, we're actually breaking off our own cells to be parts of the milk to feed our baby. So that way they're getting nutrients literally from us, which honestly was a great diet plan because when you're breastfeeding, I could eat anything and I didn't gain a lick of weight. It was all coming out um, that way into my baby. It was fascinating, actually. It also is the weirdest feeling in the world when you let down. It's just, uh, and you have no control over it, which is just mm, annoying. Anyway, so the baby controls it, not you. So anyway, so again, uh, so pinched off portions of cell come out with this, whereas this is just a secretion of like, could be, you know, sweat, could be, well, actually, this is sweat over here. Holocaine glands are sweat and stuff. So uh, American gland. So this is like actually what's happening in your stomach. This is actually a whole bunch of uh, uh, acids that are being produced right here and then coming out into the stomach to help you digest. All right. So, so again, difference between American 
apocrine, and then holocrine. Holocrine is basically what we're seeing when we're seeing oils coming out. So what's happening is cells are dividing and they're breaking down and then they, and then they uh, break down and come out. So that's the oils that we actually use to make our hair soft, um, which is funny because we use shampoo to get rid of our natural oils and then put conditioner on to replace the oils we just stripped out of our hair. It's shamp the, this, the shampoo is fascinating. Actually, all of soap is fascinating. Um, and how we, we use it to strip oils off and then we put stro oils back on that, that we didn't make because we don't like our own oils in some cases. So, although you gotta be very careful with that because like, you know, you can strip too much and damage your hair. And that's why there's always a, a very health, you gotta find your own body's healthy balance without offending everyone around you. Anyway, and trust me, if we got into like a magic, you know, school bus or school tank, because I prefer to have a tank, I don't know why. So anyway, um, if we went back in time, trust me, uh, it would be a, a, a different O difference experience, because, uh, a lot of people back then didn't wash because, well, there was a bazillion different reasons for that. So they covered themselves constantly in perfume. Apparently, uh, the reason why French uh, aristocracy was not living in Paris at the time, you know, they were all out at the, uh, oh God, now I can't think. My brain keeps pooping, uh, popping in the Louvre and I'm like, no, that's the, that's the freaking museum of art, you moron. My brain pops out the dumbest things. You know, the big palace. Well, if you're into your French history, feel free to correct me here. Anyway, um, but they weren't living in Paris for a reason. Apparently Paris used to be very, very, very stanky. So uh, yeah, anyway. So that's what's coming out here. And these guys get, are the ones that get clogged up. And that what leads to uh, our dear pimples or these ones, if they get clogged up with too many of these cells dividing and these guys don't go out, they build up, build up, build up, and you get a pimple. And if you're like me, you like watching people express pimples because what's actually coming out is something called sebum. So when you get a clog like that and you get, you know, and you go and you, you know, express the gland to get it out, um, what's coming out that, that plug is actually called sebum, which is uh, accumulation of dead cells and the oils coming from the breakdown of this, uh, what's going on in the holocrine cell uh, gland, excuse me, the holocrine gland coming out. So there you go. If you're like me and you like watching Dr. Pimple Popper or, you know, making your husband cringe every time he looks over at your phone, <laughs> he hates it. She's like, why do you watch this? And I'm like, I must watch the sebum be purged. I don't know why it calms me down so much. Anyway, there you go. So come with me if you're also somebody who enjoys watching the pimple popping. Anyway, or I should have been a dermatologist in another life. Oh, well. Anyway, connective tissues, the most abundant of all tissue types. This is pretty much the tissues that bind, support, protect, and serve as frameworks for our body. They also fill in spaces, they store fat, um, produce blood cells, fight against infection, and repair tissue damage. And sometimes when they get destroyed, these collagen fibers, as you can see, they're kind of in a weave, and that's what gives our, our, our skin strength. And you'll notice mine is nice and hydrated because it snaps right back. There is a test you can to see if you're nice and hydrated or if you've been drinking too much. Those of you in EMT classes and whatnot probably already know this, but if you pinch your skin, see how mine snaps back real good? Snaps back instantly. That means I'm really well hydrated. But if you are inundated with the alcohol, if you pinch your skin, it actually stays up longer. It doesn't snap back like that because you've actually lost water because alcohol actually inhibits a hormone that tells your body to retain water. So when you're drinking, your body just goes, lose everything? All right, and you become, that's how you become dehydrated while drinking alcohol. It's because it kind of inhibits a hormone that tells your body to retain water like it naturally would. So and that hormone, by the way, is called antidiuretic hormone. 
And we'll talk more about him in 169. He gets talked about a lot. So fun fact for later. All right. So anyway, farther apart than epithelials, these guys have an extracellular matrix between them, which is basically the glue that keeps all this stuff together. So there's all sorts of stuff all over in here. White blood cells are roaming around. We got the mast cells where we got here. We got these collagen fibers. The collagen fibers is what gives your, uh, your, your skin its elasticity. Which is why when you get older, it loses its spring and we, you know, it's, it's, it gets, it gets all over the wrinkly. And, um, unless you get the Botox and then you can't move your face. Anyway, um, adipose fa uh, fat, we always have fat everywhere, like I said. Uh, fat's actually not entirely a bad thing. We actually have fat covering all of our organs. It actually keeps our organs lubricated and protected. Um. So you need body fat. You don't need excess body fat, but you do need body fat to keep your organs running and functioning. There was actually a guy that decided to uh, try to call science's bluff in the worst way and sit there and he proclaimed that you don't need body fat to live. And everybody in, in uh, every doctor was like, oh. No, and he did. He actually exercised and had this weird diet where he didn't eat any fats. It was weird. And he did it for years. He got down to less and less and less and less body fat to the point he actually got to zero, and then he died. Because all his organs were, like, uh, completely and utterly dehydrated because without fat... Like I said, it's the lubricant that keeps a lot of these guys running. So they need some layer of fat. Actually, if you take uh, the next course and it's a hands-on one and you get to do um, some dissections, especially like of a heart, because um, uh, I'm offering a similar class like this, but it's going to be like online. Uh, the lectures are going to be online, but the uh, uh, all this... Uh, the lab will actually be in person, so if you want to, you know, join me then in the fall semester, please feel free. Um, but if you get a cow heart, you'll notice it's just, I mean, a lot of my students are stunned at just how much uh, fat is over that uh, organ. They're like, wow, that's a lot of fat. And it's true. Uh, you know, um, actually, it's a sheep heart, excuse me. And, yeah, uh, we have a lot of organs uh, covered in fat. And, like I said, fat around them actually keeps them nice and hydrated, lubricated, functioning, and protected. And zero percent body fat means you're dead. I mean, they did the autopsy on that guy, and they kind of knew what they were going to find. But it was, uh, yeah, just imagine all the uh, organs were like, ah, no, you know, completely and utterly raisin-like hard because they had nothing to keep them flexible and moist. Anyway, so connective tissues. One of the ways we classify these guys is if they stay put or if they move around. Um, there's another way that we classify them in a minute. So don't worry. There's more than one, like I said, you're going to hit this in the next few chapters of there's more than one way to classify these guys. So the first way to classify connective tissues is through if they're fixed cells or wandering cells. So fixed cells like fibroblasts, this is the most common type of fix. They're star-shaped to secrete proteins into our extracellular matrix. They maintain the collagen or the white fibers, which are your ligaments and tendons, or your elastic or yellow fibers, like your vocal cords, um, your reticular fibers, which support, you know, supportive networks to make sure you don't, you know, fall apart. And the ground substance, which is just this filler everywhere. We're like, oh, uh, let's stick that in there, give it some volume. And then there's the mast cells. These are usually near blood vessels. They release epinephrine and sometimes histamine. And we talk more about them uh, way later. We kind of touch on them where they come from. They're, um, they come out of the same stem cells that uh, give us red blood cells and um, platelets and uh, some types of white blood cells. There's two flavors of white blood cells that come from two different types of uh, stem cells. So we'll get into that next semester. But anyway, so the mast cells, they're usually near blood vessels. They're usually hanging out. They really histamine. If you know histamine, <coughs> sometimes we kind of go crazy with histamine, especially with allergies. So anyway, the ones that wander around, these are macrophages. These are known as histocytes, 
and they are used to be, or they originate as white blood cells. They're used in our immune system, and these guys are just always patrolling. They're looking around, looking for anybody trying to break through, or you trying to come in, stay out of our system. So they're kind of like the guard dogs. They're, 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 they're crawling around all through the different, in the next chapter, you're gonna see this too. We're gonna see them wandering around in, in between our skin cells. Um, you know, looking, looking for trouble. Because if a bacteria gets in on their watch, they eat them. Or if a virus tries to get, it's mostly bacteria and other things, not always a virus, but they also eat viruses too. So anything that tries to get in that isn't you, it'll eat them. So, macrophages. And they're big, that's why they're called macrophages. You find them really easy under a microscope because they're big mamajamas. All right, so connective tissues. So let's, again, we, like I said, you can do fixed or wandering. And here's another way we can do loose, dense, and specialized. And I found a map because this made way more sense than what was in the book, in, a, in, in my opinion. I, I, like I said, I like the book. This is a really good textbook. Um, but there's some moments where I'm like, yeah, I need a better picture for this to help us all understand it better. So again, different categories. You got your loose, which is your uh, areolar tissue, your adipose, fat, reticular tissue. These are all loose. Dense, these means they're tightly, tightly packed. So you got dense regular connective tissue, which is uh, the white and the yellow elastic, which is the cord or a tendon and a sheet. They come in a sheet format. So cord or tendons come in sheets as well as they do cords. Uh, same thing with ligaments. So yellow elastic connective tissue are the ligaments. Uh, again, they come in a cord variety and a sheet variety. So like for instance, um, our vocal cords, they're in the cord variety, um, the tendon. So remember white fibrous is tendon, yellow elastic is ligament. Okay. That's going to come back later. All right, specialized connective tissues. These are the ones that a lot of people go, wait, that's a connective tissue? Because you don't really think about that. So like bones, bones, and we think, you know, like I, we talk about the skeleton a little later, and I'll pull out my box of bones and play with them, and, you know, in front of you. And um, so we've got the compact and the spongy bone. We're going to, don't panic too much on this, because trust me, he gets his own chapter. We get to talk all about him then. Blood is a connective tissue, and he again, he gets his own chapter next semester. Cartilage, so this is the one we're going to drill down on a bit here, although he also gets uh, his own little part of a chapter in, in when we talk about the skeletal system. So these guys we talk about together because they're usually together, holding each other together. So cartilage, we got the highline cartilage, the fibrous cartilage, and the elastic cartilage. Um, and again, we're going to get into these three flavors a little later. Um, they do, we do talk about them usually when we talk about the skeletal system because cartilage is also a thing that helps keep your skeletal system together because we don't want that falling apart. Right, Monty? Right. Anyway, so again, just going over the different categories again. So we got loose which is this collagen fibers, other fibers, uh, adipose, which is fat, uh, blood. We got the fibrous, which is the ligaments, um, the cartilages, and the bone. So, like I said, there's different ways if you want how to, how to break these guys up into categories. Yay, anatomy and physiology. We're going to hit that a couple of times. So anyway, membranes. So epithelial membranes are thin structures that are composed of epithelium and underlying connective tissue. So we're going to get into our buddy cutaneous in the next chapter. Cutaneous is a skin, your integumentary system. So you got basically four different types. You got your serous membranes. Um, these are usually called your uh, mesothelium, your basement membrane. It's a thin layer of loose connective tissue. You've got your mucous membranes, which you know, lines the cavities that open to outside of the body because mucus is actually one of your uh, physical barriers to your immune system, uh, you know, to keep things out. That's why we want to trap it. That's why you have, if you've ever wondered why you have snot, that's why. It's not a problem until you make too much. Uh, 
I live for your groans, even though I can only imagine them right now. Anyway, so secrete mucus contains epithelium with goblet cells, basement membranes, sometimes smooth muscle found in the respiratory, digestive, urinary, and reproductive systems. Again, it's to catch things trying to get into our body and bog them down in the mucus so they don't get any further. And then a macrophage can come by and nom, 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 nom. So it's, it's, it's why we have earwax. It's why we have nose hairs. It's, it's why we have all these weird things. So that way we can trap anything trying to get inside. Because we don't want outside getting inside that messes with the inside area. As in, and maintaining the name of the game, homeostasis. I wish I had the editing skills to do this. What? And then like homeostasis and the rainbow. I don't yet. One day. So anyway, cutaneous membrane. Uh, we already talked. He's get his own chapter next time. Synovial. He gets, again, when we talk about joints, we're going to talk about synovial big time. So they're going to come back to us. Synovial, these line uh, movable joints. They produce uh, fluid rich and high hyaluronic acid, which is good because we don't want our joints to be unlubricated. Actually, without this uh, hyaluronic acid, if we were to run um, our knees, the friction between just our knees and uh, the two bones right here, even with the cartilage rubbing against each other, without this synovial fluid, we, our knees would actually burst into flame if we tried to run without joint fluid. So imagine all the Olympics <laughs> and everybody's doing the marathon and all their knees burst into flame. Oh, anyway, so thank goodness for joint fluid, right? Nobody wants their knees bursting into flames. So again, he goes over the different tissues in here. He goes over all types of connective tissues. So let's now talk about Muscle tissue. Like I said, skeletal uh, muscle gets its own party later on in chapter 9. Yeah, I think it's chapter 9. Is it chapter 9, Monty? Anyway. So, uh, yeah. Um, so we're going to talk about these guys big time. Uh, you won't talk about these guys. Uh, we will talk about these guys here, and then we're going to talk about them when we talk about the cardiac system in next semester in 169. So this is where I was talking about those intercalculated discs. Notice how they have these discs that are holding the cells together. So this is like one cell here, and he's got a disc here, disc here. That's his boundaries. But remember when I was talking about those discs um, have these gap junctions between them. So that way that allows all the cells in your heart to act as one unit. Even though they're separate cells, it allows the signals to make your heart pump move through as a perfect unit because it allows faster travel for what's stimulating the muscle, which is usually calcium uh, ions. And we'll get into that in the skeletal system chapter. So that's moving through, moving through, moving through. So pretty cool. There we go, back again. So that's how these intercalculated discs with those gap junctions allow for these separated cells to work as one, which is what we need when we're pumping blood. We don't need them to go in different directions and do things at different times, and we need them working as one perfect, flawless pump. And um, that's how we achieve that with these intercalculated discs with the gap junctions in between. Um, so there's like really, even though there's two separate cells, there's nothing in between them uh, slowing the signal transmission down. And you'll notice the intercalculated discs are a big thing. You can see them right here. Um, that's usually when you're looking under a microscope, you'll see these bad boys. Uh, same thing here. Uh, it's usually striated. So striations, and we're going to talk about what these striations are when we talk about skeletal muscle. Trust me, we get into this big time. So this is a muscle fiber. If it has striations, the nuclei are kind of like dots on the side. You'll see the nuclei are kind of shoved up on one side. That lets you know it's a skeletal muscle. And a lot of people, and there's striations here too, which is why a lot of people kind of go, hmm. But look for the bigger nuclei in the heart muscle and look for those intercalculated discs. That's your tip off. Also, if it looks kind of more branched, this kind of looks like, I don't know to me, it looks like a fish fillet to me. Of course, 
what we're eating actually is fish muscles, so that's probably why it looks like a fish fly to me. Um, so that's kind of, and again, I'm going to show you some slides in a minute so you can kind of get a, again, an eye for the, di the differences. Because um, I used to put up pictures, uh, and uh, it, uh, people would usually get these two confused, something fierce, or sometimes these two because of the nuclei looking. Because these guys, they're not branched, and they do not have striations. So smooth muscle is found usually um, around all of our uh, walls and our internal organs is involuntary. We don't have to think about moving um, smooth muscle, unlike muscle, uh, you know, uh, and thankfully we don't have to think about, you know, our heart either. That's also involuntary. Good God, could you imagine having, on top of everything else, having to try and focus on making your heart beat? I mean, I don't have time for that. Nobody got time for that. Thank God it does it on its own. Anyway, like breathing. Thank God I don't have to think about that, except sometimes I talk so much and then I choke on my own spit in the middle of a lecture. Just saying. Anyway, so again, smooth muscle moves in waves, which is called peristalsis. So it moves in waves. And they're not branched, they're just kind of touching each other. Again, um, so a lot of people I've seen, a lot of people get smooth and cardiac mixed up under a, a microscope. Um, most people are really good about, it's like, is this skeletal? And they're like, yes, this is skeletal. So, um, so keep in mind, you don't see the intercalculated discs in um, the smooth muscle like you do the cardiac muscle, okay? So hopefully pointing these things out to be aware of if you're looking at a picture. I don't believe I put any pictures in the exam for this chapter, which is, should be the exam number three. So I, I usually save these for like when I do lab exams because I prefer doing things you look at. I prefer concept and lecture exams and I prefer, you know, actually looking at pictures and slides and lab exams because I just feel that's a more, which in this class I, you don't get because you're doing labsters. So it's all we, but I'm still going to show you some slides after this real quick. All right, so anyway, so again, see all this fun stuff. That's different. So again, smooth muscle is involuntary. It's usually the smooth movements, like when you swallow, that takes over, and then it becomes peristalsis, it's a, a ripple, like doing the wave in a, um, in, a, in a stadium with your favorite team of a sport you enjoy. Yes. I don't know if you enjoy a sport of your choice. Anyway, so striated branches, uh, uninucleated fibers, occurs in the whorls of the heart, is involuntary, so we don't have to think about it. Skeletal muscles, striated, uh, tubular, notice, you know, it runs in these long tubes, so you don't see that with these guys. Uh, Multinucleated fibers, so they have a nuclei that kind of works for several areas. Um, is attached to the skeletal, uh, skeleton and is voluntary, so that way we can control our limbs. Hopefully. Last but not least, our friend, the nervous tissue. Yes, my brain, my one brain cell right here. Now, like I said, he gets three chapters to himself at the end of the semester. So <laughs> that's why I'm just going to touch and run on him because we're going to get back and, and, and go into crazy land with these guys. So basically just know what's going on here. Uh, with a neuron, you've got two flavors of nervous tissue. You've got the neurons, which are the big boys, and you've got the neuroglia. The neuroglia are, are several different types. It just shows one here. This is an astrocyte but there's like six different types and these are support cells these guys help these guys do their jobs because these guys are so specialized that we can't uh make any more of them once we've made them all and once you once one's dead that's it we they don't they they're so specialized they cannot go through mitosis um these guys actually have to feed them and protect them because they're so busy doing their job, which is basically running our nervous system and our brain, and we kind of need those things, you know. So anyway, so that way we don't have to think about our heart and our breathing for the most part. Anyway, so what's happening is you got your cell body right here, you got your nucleus, and all these things sticking out that look like tree branches, like right up here, these are called dendrites. And this is how other, neur uh, other neurons uh, connect with them. 
And then they have this long tail in the middle. This is called their axon. Okay, so they've got this long, funky tail. And at the end, they have the axon terminal, which is the part that actually touches, or actually it doesn't touch. That's how crazy your brain is. We'll get into that in a minute. Um, that actually connects, sort of, with other cells by getting really, 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 really close to, but not really touching the dendrites. So like if, I'm just gonna use him, like, so just imagine like, here's a, den here's a uh, axon terminal. It would get it like, and this top half is another, I need two of these, I guess. Anyway, and it would get really, really, really close, but it wouldn't touch. So yeah, your nervous system is not touching your nervous system. Your brain is not touching your brain. We'll get into that more in coming chapters if you think that's insane. Anyway, and there's different flavors. We got our motor neurons. We'll actually talk about the motor neurons a bit when we talk about our skeletal system um, and our um, muscle, skeletal muscle system. So we'll talk about the muscles. Uh, we got interneurons. These are the ones that basically bring things back up to the brain and back down to the brain. Like if you step on a Lego, these are the ones that transmit the ow up to your head and you go ow and then you get your foot off the thing. Uh, and then the sensory neurons. These guys are funky. So we'll talk more about the sensory neurons. Again, all of these and more await you in chapter 10, 11, and 12. And that's that for this. Let's see how we're doing on time, because I don't want to, like, make you go insane. Mm, it's about an hour. Okay, so I'll do a second half to this chapter where I'm just going over some slides, so that way we can break this up a bit, so you're not going... Anyway, because I prefer to do this in chunks where your brain can actually absorb this and not like overwhelm you, which unfortunately this course is kind of overwhelming to begin with, so apologies ahead of time. Anyway, with that said, I'll see you in the next bit where we, I will show you some actual slides and I will go over the differences between, you know, squamous, cuboidal, and um, columnar and show you how to kind of uh, differentiate between the two, or three, excuse me, what did I say two? Um, and uh, also look at some, we'll look at some heart cells. Are you giving me kisses? And um, yeah, some, excuse me, muscle cells, the different types of muscle cells. And we'll call it a day and then we'll move on to the integumentary system because your skin is good. All right, with that said, see you in a bit, bye.